So here's the situation. You or a family member are deaf or have lost some hearing, and ideally you're in a position to potentially benefit from a conventional hearing aid. But for one reason or another, you are simply unable to benefit from those hearing aids. And common reasons for that include infection, previous surgery, or not having the right kind of anatomy. Now for previous generations, the journey has prematurely ended there for a number of people who have then had to struggle on with their hearing. But hopefully in 2023, your audiologist or medical professional has suggested the idea of trying a bone conduction hearing device or implant. Something that's gonna lighten your listening effort and get you integrated into social and family conversations again. Now it's fair to say that awareness about those different options is still growing. After all, what was available even five years ago is different to what's available now. And so it's understandably difficult to be a patient in that scenario, wondering which device might be right for you. So in this video, I'm gonna give a rundown of all the different bone conduction devices and implants that are available in 2023 and how to decide which one might be right for you and all the things that you're going to need to consider to make the right choice. Now there are a couple of implants that have been and gone over the years just to say I'm not going to cover those in this video. This is a video focusing on what I see as your main choices today and as for my other videos it's worth saying that this video is not endorsed or sponsored by any of the implant manufacturers, although we do continue to enjoy a good working relationship with all of them, which is something that really benefits our patients. Now for many years, we've known that delivering sound via bone conduction, meaning vibrating sound through the skull, was an effective way of bypassing problems with the outer and middle ear, enabling us to get sound directly to the inner ear and to the brain and enable clear hearing. Now you might be familiar with aftershocks bone conduction headphones which are commercially available and very popular with cyclists and swimmers. Now when we step up that concept to a medical grade, you have the bone anchored hearing aid worn on a headband. And this works in a similar fashion, but can deliver higher levels of amplification to help those with lower levels of natural hearing. Now here's a picture of a young child wearing a bone anchored hearing aid on a soft band. And this technology is available for adults too. And in view of the cosmetic considerations around this sort of device. There are now adaptations to that, including the Sound Arc from Cochlear and the Adhere from Medel. And these three devices are all potentially good options for people with good inner ear hearing function who can't wear conventional hearing aids and are keen to avoid any form of surgery. However, there are limitations with all three of these types of non-surgical bone conduction devices. It's fair to say they can all suffer with problems related to feedback if they're not positioned correctly. And wearing a tight-fitting headband all day can lead to headaches too. And in terms of cosmesis, an eight-year-old girl might be more willing to wear uh, a headband, but it might be a more difficult sell for a teenage boy, for example, although everyone has their own preferences. The Sound Arc is arguably aiming to be a little bit more stylish, although it's, you do have to have the right shaped head for it to fit snugly. And the Adhere is the more dainty option, but you do have to have near perfect bone conduction thresholds to be able to benefit from its degree of amplification, as there are limits to how much you can turn up the gain on an adhesive device like that. So in a situation where you like and want to benefit from bone conduction devices, but you don't want to wear a headband, or you're aiming for higher clarity and levels of amplification, we're gonna to need to turn to bone conduction hearing implants. Since the 1980s, up until the last decade, the one option we had in this scenario was the percutaneous bone conduction hearing implant, colloquially known as the Baja. And what started off as a fairly complex operation in the late 80s, with limited funding, several stages needed to the surgery, a fair amount of skin complications and revisions, is now a more simple implantable technology that has and continues to change thousands of lives. Now you can watch the full video of the history and progression of Baja on one of my other videos on my channel, but essentially this is the Baja as it is today. It involves a titanium abutment which shows through the skin, attached to a titanium fixture beneath, which is surgically installed and integrated into the bone of the skull, and onto the abutment clips an external processor, which doesn't need to be attached to a soft band. What's evolved over the years is that implantation surgery can now take place with the patient fully awake, and it takes about 10 minutes per side now. There are two brands, Cochlear with their trademarked Baja, and Oticon who have the Ponto. 
And for the last year, we've been able to install the Ponto through just a skin punch using their mono technique without a full cut in the scalp. Both sides can be done in one go if necessary. And as a patient, you can have inner ear levels of hearing down to up to 65 decibels before you stop being able to benefit from such a device. So that's a very wide range of fitting criteria, which means that lots of people might be able to benefit from this. The Baja processor is typically the smallest of all the devices I'm about to show you, and the processor can be positioned nicely tucked away behind the ear. You can stream directly to the device from your phone or any other Bluetooth technology, and there aren't usually many anatomical considerations, and most people's skulls will fit this device without any problem, to the extent that we typically don't usually even have to get a CT scan as part of the preoperative workup. The downsides of this device are that it is visible when the processor is taken off, and the fact that the metal pierces the skin means that there is a higher chance of skin and wound complications compared to the magnetic options that I'm going to show you. Now those rates of problems have reduced as the technology has become more refined but it's still something to consider and this technology may also pose a challenge for people that need to wear helmets regularly. In more recent times uh, an implant company called Medel have tried to address some of the drawbacks of Baja with two of their devices, the Medel Bone Bridge and the Medel Vibrant Sound Bridge. Now I'm going to focus on the Bone Bridge here since this is a video about bone conduction implants, but if you want to find out more about the Vibrant Sound Bridge, then I have a video on that on my channel. The Bone Bridge worked in a similar way to Baja, except that the processor, instead of clipping onto metal directly, attaches via magnet through the skin. And this means that when the implant processor is removed, there is nothing physically visible from the outside. That means we're able to avoid some of the skin and wound complications that have typically affected Baja users in the past. But with the skin being an obstacle now to overcome, the device is slightly less powerful than a conventional Baja, and so your inner ear hearing levels need to be 40 decibels or better to benefit from hearing into the same side, and really needs to be 20 decibels or better if you're sending sound over to the other ear. It's worth pointing out that not all skulls will fit the bone bridge implant, particularly if there has been previous surgery, for example, for cholesteatoma. Medell brought out a shallower version two of their bone bridge in 2019, and that has done a lot to help that situation. But it's true to say that there are still some cases where even the newer bone bridge doesn't quite fit in the place we would want it to go. We typically do a CT scan to establish if positioning it was feasible before going ahead with the bone bridge. The implant does bend to the required shape, which means we can tuck it away behind the ear um, to a significant degree for the best cosmetic outcome. And although doing the surgery under local anaesthetic alone is possible, generally we would use a general anaesthetic for this operation, as it's a little bit more involved. We drill a well for the internal moving parts to sit, and usually recovery involves sutures, a head bandage, and a few hours stay in hospital. It's also worth mentioning that streaming to this device is possible, although typically you will need to wear an extra device in order to connect your phone to the device itself. In 2021, the cochlear ossia came along, and we thought at the time that perhaps it would be the ultimate answer to both the Baja and the bone bridge. You've got a magnetic implant, so no metal showing through the skin, but with the same bony footprint as a Baja, meaning you're not so worried about whether it will fit into the skull or not. It also has a wider fitting criteria in the bone bridge, meaning that we can implant patients with bone conduction levels down to as low as 55 decibels, and direct streaming is possible too. And by all accounts, it's proved to be a very popular device. I would say about 50% of our current cohort are choosing this implant. And all the recipients so far have been generally very happy with it, as they have been with the bone bridge and Baja options too. Before everyone rushes to a conclusion though, it's worth pointing out a few important considerations with regards to the ossea. When you've got an implant where less metal is integrated into the bone, that usually means that more metal needs to sit outside of the bone. And so as such, the ossea can be a little bit more feelable under the skin compared to the bone bridge, particularly in kids and ladies with thin skin. Some people do notice a slight bump, although I can't by any means say that this has been a major problem for the majority. Another consideration is the positioning and prominence of the external processor. And this is important because I think many people will be choosing this device for its potential cosmetic benefits over a Baja. And so I always make sure I explain to people that yes, this is a magnetic option with no metal showing through the skin, but the processor is typically more than twice the size of the smallest Baja processor, for example. And in the case of the Ossia, to find a flat piece of bone means that the processor typically needs to sit 
higher up and more prominent on the skull rather than tucked away behind the ear. Osseo users are also reporting a higher frequency of battery changes, although this obviously depends on the level of use involved. Another key consideration of magnetic solutions in general, that's the bone bridge and the osseo, is the issue of MRI artifacts. If you have one of these magnetic implants installed and you later need to have an MRI scan of your brain, then it's worth noting that some or all of the picture will be obscured by the metal in the implant. In the case of the bone bridge, it becomes difficult to view the area of the ear on an MRI scan because of the artifact. And that's particularly important if you're looking for recurrent disease in cholesteatoma, for example. And in the case of the ossea, with the magnet not removed, it actually obscures nearly the whole brain. And so that's really important to consider if you're someone that's likely to need MRI scanning in the future. The magnet can be removed with an operation and that will shrink the artifact down somewhat, although there's still a significant amount obscured. And if you really needed a diagnostic brain scan for any reason, then it's likely that you may have to have the implant removed in order to have that, or rely on CT scan imaging if that's appropriate. The artifact caused by a Baja is very minimal in comparison. And so with the advent of Baja moving to an incisionless technique that's possible under local anaesthetic only in about 10 minutes, what we're still finding is that in 2023, there remain good options for various different patients to choose all three devices, depending on their differing priorities and individual circumstances. And really, as a hearing implant surgeon, the main thing in my mind is that people are counseled really thoroughly and given all the information they need to make the right decision for them. So I hope this video has been helpful in informing you around those options and perhaps helping you to know what questions you need to ask in the clinic consultation in order to reach the right conclusion for you. If you've got this far, then please do let me know in the comments. And when I know that people have found these videos helpful, then it spurs me on to make more.